Hello again. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Community Voices digital offering presented to you by the Arts Engagement Department of the Old Globe in San Diego, California. I'm your host, Katie Haroff, the Community Voices program creator and a manager with the Old Globe. I'm so happy to be back here with all of you for our fourth full workshop. Um, today, we'll be focusing on getting your short place started, which is really the most difficult thing to do to start. But hopefully, for those of you that have been following along with our previous workshops, you'll have enough brainstorming and dialogue experimentation under your belt to feel really prepared for today. If this is your first time tuning in, that's okay too. As I mentioned at the beginning of all of these workshops, they will continuously be individually entertaining and helpful for any writer. However, they will definitely be the most helpful in sequence. Fortunately, all of our previous videos will continue to be posted on our Community Voices event page, along with a little further down on the Arts Engagement page. If you have any trouble finding them, please feel free to let us know in the comments and, and we can point you into the right direction. As always, I have my fabulous assistants with me today, Gil Sotu and Mickey Vale. Hello to both of you. My check-in question for you both today is, what has been one of the most, one of your most favorite locations that you've ever set a play in? What is your most favorite play setting? Um, let's start with Mickey. Mickey, what is one of your favorite locations you've set a play in? Uh, one of my favorite locations has been in a therapist's office. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> what, what about, what, why did you enjoy that location? Because it was just very simple and to the point and um, full of drama. You could just focus on all the drama really easily. Absolutely. That is a great location to anticipate drama in, which is you know, sometimes the location takes away a lot of the work for you. Wherever it's set might really inform the play as a whole. So absolutely, a therapist's office is very informative and opens us up for potentially a very exciting moment. Gil, what was one of your most favorite settings that you developed in a play? Well, I just happened to get commissioned recently by the the Old Globe, and Woo! I set the play. I know, right? Uh, I set the ten minute play in a jungle, but this is a, a courtroom. Uh, so the courtroom's right in the smack in the middle of the jungle, and all the animals are the defendants and and the lawyers and everything. So it's really fun. That is so fun and really cool. And to have a courtroom in the middle of the jungle is a little surrealistic and very informative of what kind of world we are coming into right away. Wonderful. Right. Thank you both for sharing those answers with me. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have today two guest actors with us again to help present our lesson. And I'd love to also check in and introduce both of them as well. Uh, we have Laura Zablit and the marvelous Jake Milligard. Thank you both so much for being here today. You might recognize Laura from the Behind the Curtain workshops, also here on our page on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. And Jake has, uh, is a teaching artist with the Old Globe and he's joined us as an actor in the second full Community Voices presentation. Welcome you two, welcome back Jake. Um, I'm going to ask that this check-in question to you two a little bit differently as actors. So as actors, what has been the favorite lo favorite setting of a play that you've performed in? And let's start with Laura. Laura, what was one of your favorite setting locations of a play you performed in? I would say I was in a production of Charles Mee's Trojan Women, A Love Story, uh, that was directed by Lori Carlos. And Charles Mee's writing is always is so, is so ab abstract and I, I don't even remember if, if he specifically laid out where the play is taking place, but we didn't work with it if he did and our, our director also did not specify that for us. So because the setting was a little bit ambiguous that allowed the actors every day to show up and by reading the lines and experiencing the show again and again, discovering and learning and looking around and trying to learn about where we were um, through the experience of it. So I think that was my favorite 
my favorite setting experience as an actor. That's a wonderful point to make. And it's a good point to make for all the people at home. Sometimes less of a setting is a lot more enjoyable for those that are performing and being the creative guides of these pieces. If you give a director a very open-ended setting or, or background of your work, they might explore a whole new world just because your words inspire them. So both are the right answer, deep detailed settings and light open settings. It kind of depends on your personal preference. Um, Jake, how about you? What was the setting that you really enjoyed performing in as an actor? Oh, one of the ones that uh, is most memorable and the one I really enjoyed was uh, actually a production I was in at the, at the Old Globe. It was uh, Scott Ellis's Comedy of Errors out on the Shakespeare stage. And it was set in 1920s New Orleans, which is just kind of like a fun time, a fun vibe. The music helped really set up um, what the world was in the play. And the fact that I got to play in a New Orleans jazz band was a dream come true. Um, and so, yeah, so that was one of those things that I feel like the setting really helped set up and highlight, you know, this language that's so old, highlight it in a new way, um, uh, just based on the setting that it was in. That's really cool. Uh, Shakespeare is one of those wonderful playwrights that a lot of people have taken on many different adaptations of, it, of, their, of his work and have set them in all different kinds of places, post-apocalyptic in New Orleans, <laughs> in the jazz moment. Um, I was also in a production of Comedy of Errors that maybe would have benefited from having a more specific <laughs> choice of the setting. Um, and maybe I would have liked to be in the New Orleans version of that. Well, thank you both so much for sh uh, sharing with us. We're gonna see you both a little bit later today. One of my favorite plays that I developed uh, was called Red Planet Respite. And I was really fortunate to work with NASA scientists to develop a play that would take place on Mars in the future. <laughs> it was a lot of fun to explore a futuristic sci-fi production, but I had to do a lot of research to make that realistic, which is a really great note uh, for all of you at home. If you don't have a lot of time to research a new subject or a new world to explore on stage, maybe instead use this specific moment to explore a story or idea you already know about, you're already connected to. A lot of times we're excited by an idea of something and then we set out to start exploring it and realize that we don't have all the resources or tools to tell that story. But if you like, I always reference in this workshop, if you use yourself as your reference for your play, it's going to be very accessible to you. You're not going to need to do the research on your own life because you lived it. However, if you have that time to do that research justice right now, by all means, dig in. It could be really exhilarating to learn about a new world and to utilize theater to do that. And if any of you would like to share with us a setting you've enjoyed from a play you've seen or a film you love, please do. You can comment it in underneath this video. I'd love to hear about the environments that made you excited. And it's great to think about the different worlds of our favorite media and how those environments influence those stories so that we can think about our own writing and where we might like to set our own pieces. All right, now we're gonna just take a moment. I'm gonna do this pretty quickly today um, as we do in every session to just check in and reset our bodies and minds so that we can dive into some creativity. So just as we always do, let's just start by resetting our breath. Take a long inhale in, hold it at the top and then release it nice and long and steady. And let's do that again. Deep inhale, inhale in, hold long. And as you exhale out, see if you can roll your shoulders back and down your back. So you have nice tall posture for this. Now, I'm going to guide you through a couple of, of chair stretches. As I do that, please make sure to connect with your breath and keep that long, steady, loving breath. These are three yoga twisting chair stretches. Now, if you have any physical concerns at home, 
just skip this part or do a small abridged version of what I'm doing. These are pretty loving and easy, but you know your body best and please, please be mindful of it. Um, if anyone is enjoying any at-home yoga right now, <laughs> um, you might recognize some of these moves. I'm a big fan of Yoga with Adrian channel, if anyone needs a recommendation. And I stole all three of these very easy moves from her. First, let's just start with a very gentle neck stretch by turning your head to the right. As far as it can go, take a breath and go ahead and bring it to the, to the front. And then just all the way to the left. Breath. And let it go. Good, that's our first twist. Next, go ahead and take your right hand and cross it over your body and put it on your left hip. Take your left hand, place it behind you in the chair, see if there's any place you can hold on to, and then go ahead and take your hand and Now we kind of do a little wave over to the other side. Put your left hand on your right hip, your right hand behind your body in the chair. And a little gentle twist. And breathe. Great. Now come on back. And our last little move. Go ahead and lift your arms up to the sky. And you're gonna go ahead and drop one arm and bring your left arm over or your right, whichever one is good. Go ahead and contract a little bit and then go ahead and reach it. Good, now let's do that with our right. We drop our left, lift our right arm, go ahead and contract a little bit in your chair and then reach it back. Good, go ahead and bring that back down. And there you are. <laughs> That's all we're doing today for our little body warm up check in. And, you know, feel free to uh, continue to move through all those stretches a couple of times during our session. Or if it feels good to you while you're listening to me, extend your stretches and get into those nice moves and help loosen up your body. Do something good for your body today because you deserve it. Now, hopefully that little physical check-in helped bring you back into this present moment with me today. Um, now I'm going to hand things over to the marvelous Gil Sotu, who will be leading us through a writing warm-up. Hey, Gil, you ready for that? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right, you take it away. <laughs> All right, so uh, today we're going to be exploring the wonderful world of haiku. Uh, for those of you who do not know or haven't tried, uh, haiku is a form of poetry started in Japan uh, and it is now all the craze with all the cool kids here. So you're in good hands. So here we go. Um, the rules for a haiku, uh, at least the rules we're going to be using, is three lines. Uh, first line is going to have five syllables. The second line is going to have seven syllables. And the third line is going to have five syllables again. Okay, so you can, uh, we have a, a prompt for you. Today's prompt is, what was an inciting incident that inspired a positive change in your life? So what do I mean by inciting it incident? So in, in all stories, mostly, there is an inciting incident, something, something that happened to your character, and you can put this in your own plays yourself, something that happened to your character that changes the course of their, their life some way, somehow. You know, it really kicks off and starts the story. So think about your own life. What, what thing happened that really started a, a, a positive change in your life? Maybe it's writing a play for the first time or whatever it is. So uh, I wrote one myself just to kind of show you. Um, this is called How to Float Collectively. How to Float Collectively. Here we go. Holding the sun's hand, I embrace the crowd with love, never touching ground. So that was five syllables in the first, holding the sun's hand, seven in the, in the middle, and then the end is uh, another five. So here's my, my challenge to you. Go ahead and come up with your own haiku. 
uh, put it in the comment section, or if you want, you can email it to Katie. At the end of this session, we're going to read a few of them and see what some of the ones that you guys uh, came up with. I'm excited to, to read it all. And as a bonus, uh, we've enlisted some of our mighty writers to uh, share with us what they have. Uh, first, I want to start with Mickey. Hi. Yeah. Um, so this one's called Muscle Memory. Okay. Here I am again, earthbound, floating beneath skies like I never left. Mm. And that's about the first time I rode a bike as an adult. I hadn't uh, ridden a bike and since I was in high school mm -hmm. and I was 30 something and I, I got on a bike and it just felt so amazing. And then I just mm -hmm. started riding my bike all the time after that. And I got in great shape. It was no wonderful. training wheels, huh? No, no. <laughs> Hop right back on it. Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, I recently got back on a bike after years and, and it's this exhilarating feeling. So I really love that poem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mickey. Next, let's go to Laura. How you doing, Laura? I'm good. How are you doing, Gil? I'm fantastic. All right. So uh, what is your poem? So my poem is called The Abbot. Okay. And here it is. Laughter and clippers, stripe by stripe, release me from the burden of hair. Uh, that is about shaving my head while learning about the life of a Buddhist monastic, which I did wow. for a while in China. Wow. That's wonderful. And, and um, so here's a here's a little tip for everybody is that you can use the title to help inform what the poem is about. So that's a little cheat. So, you know, and uh, you have, you know, 575 to tell the story, but you can also use that title to give a little bit of insight like Laura just did so wonderfully and and Mickey and myself. OK, next we have the mighty, mighty Jake Milgar. What's up, Jake? Hey. Hey. How's it going? I'm good, man. Feeling good. Good. <laughs> so what do you what do you uh, uh, what do you have for us? What haiku kung fu do you have for us? Um. Well, you know, uh, being quarantined with my family, uh, you know, you, you think back, uh, you know, through the uh, wanting of, you know, maybe, you know, strangling some of your family members because you can't get away from them. I don't know. Um, but I started thinking. <laughs> I, I started. I started thinking about. Uh, the good thoughts and one of them was uh the day my uh, oldest son was born mm. and so this is about this it's called the day my son was born mm. my new normal there looking to me for guidance <sighs> please don't screw him up <laughs> oh love it you changed it from rehearsal that's great i did i did and, a little uh, sweet and I, and I always feel bad that, you know, my first thought of my great inciting incident is me performing and yours is your kid and we're both performers. So I, I'm kind of falling behind the curve, but that's okay though. I, I, that's why I always strive to, to look up to Jake as we all should. I'm gonna bring this back to Katie. Oh, I just enjoyed all of that. I also wrote a haiku, I'm gonna yes. share it. It's called Gone. Um, she isn't here now. It's time to move and make it. It's time to live hard. And this is about a moment I quit a job. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Gil, so much for leading us through that. And just like Gil said, if any of you watching today would like to share in the comments section your own haiku, we would really love to read your work today live. Uh, a bunch of people sent us their six word memoirs on Tuesday. Now we would love to read your life-changing haikus. Um, and once again, Gail, thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> I hope everyone is either on the way to or feeling pretty warm in both your minds and body. So we gotta get down to business. It's time to get you all started and writing your plays. Finally, we are ready to begin. Your assignment for this week will be to write as much of your first page as much as possible. Yes, the intro to your, to your play. This is your assignment for next Tuesday. Um, now that might seem just not like a lot, just one page, lady, uh, can't we just get down to business? Sure. Some of you may be absolutely ready to get to the creative business. Um, and But for those of you that are following along, we're going to continue setting you up in these small, digestible steps. The biggest reason I lead participants through this process step-by-step step 
is to encourage experimentation throughout this and brainstorming prep so the writing is the easiest part of the development. If you're a speedy worker, feel free to write your heart out this weekend and beyond and go through these lessons with a couple of pieces if the inspiration hits you. I have worked with every variety of writer throughout the Community Voices Workshop. So I lead for those that like to inch through this in small steps, but I'm ready for all of you work ahead people. I invite all of you to continue to send me your work, no matter where you are in your process. But I'd like to just go ahead and open up today's handout and dig in. It should be in the comments section of this video. We also posted it a little bit earlier also on our, on our main page. And so that should be somewhere accessible and available to you. If not, that's okay. We're going to go through it with you today and you can follow along as well. Um, but if you can open it up, once again, it's called the Play Structure Outline. Uh, at out, and it's not a handout like the past handouts that you're going to fill out. It's actually a handout that you get to replicate. Uh, this handout is a complete, it is its own completed first page of a script, but it also includes some directions. And we're going to go through all of it with you right now. So Gil and Mickey, let's have the two of you read through this with me. Um, let me open up my own handout. You all have it open at home, that's great. Uh, we're just gonna go through it in sections. So it starts by asking you to title your play, ah, which is a very scary thing to do. This can change at any point and if you not in the place yet where you feel comfortable coming up with a title. You could just call it untitled for now, title it later. Sometimes the title comes from the script as a whole. But for those of you that are ready to title your piece, title that. Um, the next section, Gil, if I could have you read for us the, the information under characters. Sure. Uh, Always start your play with your character list and a short description of each character. If you have several scenes, each with different characters, put a character list at the top of each scene. If you only have one set of characters throughout the play, you only need to include this singular list at the beginning of your entire play. Yep, that's it. So that's just some information of, of how to lay out your character list. It also has examples of three characters that are a part of this hypothetical play example that we're using. Um, how about Mickey, let read through us the couple of character descriptions that are on this page. Okay. Leslie, mom in her 30s, very overprotective of her teenage children, tightly wound. Jeffrey, a 13-year-old boy, rebellious, film and music enthusiast, and police officer. If you have a small character whose role is, is clear in the name, you don't have to include a description. Perfect. So in this play, in this hypothetical play, there's only three characters. Um, the last character, like it said, is a police officer. It doesn't matter what they look like. There's a good chance that this character in this play doesn't have a lot to do other than be a police officer. And sometimes it's nice not to include incredible details of a character because it makes casting a little easier for the director. They will cast whoever they decide looks like a police officer. And you could do that with other characters of that nature, a doctor, a nurse, a lawyer, someone who doesn't have a ton of agency in your piece, but their title. Uh, and, and that's up to you. Maybe you really want to give a strong description to that police officer because you have your own vision of who that really needs to be. The cool thing about the first part of this worksheet is that most of you who have been following along have already written the character description. So this is pretty easy. This is just you diving in and describing all of the characters in your piece instead of just the one. The next section of this is where we are getting into some new territory and why we're sort of focusing our conversation today around the setting of a play. And that is the section of the setting and the at rise. Let's start with the setting. Gil, what does it say under the setting? Under setting. Uh, 
at the top of each scene, state the time and location. This is at Lincoln Middle School, 1 p.m. springtime. Yes, the setting is the simple description of where they are. We just need to know where exactly they are, what time of day it is. Uh, the, these elements might seem like they're not super important, but the time of day is very influential over the, the actors that are playing in this. This specific scene is set at 1 p.m. and we're at a middle school. Now that gives you an idea that it is during school hours. It is sunny out. There are probably a lot of kids around. However, if this play was set at Lincoln Middle School at 1 a.m., that completely changes what the setting is. It really changes the mood and the tone and really what could happen in this specific moment of this play. The next section is the at rise. So Mickey, why don't you read for us what's under the at rise part? At rise, include information on what the audience will see on stage before dialogue begins, such as, Leslie is sitting outside the principal's office with her son, Jeffrey, waiting for a meeting. They are both visibly uncomfortable. Yep, so an at rise is the theater term for what an audience will see as soon as the curtain rises. That's all it means. What is the exact image that you as the playwright want to make sure the audience sees before any of the dialogue starts? At rises, I've seen every kind of at rise there is. I've seen at rises that are three sentences. Michael walks in. <laughs> and then I've seen at rises that last several pages. These at rise describe the action of a character that the playwright wants the audience to see before they have any dialogue. I remember reading a script that had about three pages of an at rise describing a woman cleaning up an environment. And that whole action needed to play out before she said anything to anyone on stage. So whatever it is you need the audience to see before the characters start talking is what you will include in your at rise, what we see when the curtain rises. A lot of theaters don't have curtains anymore. So that's a little bit of an antiquated term, but we keep it because we like it. And it also could just mean when the lights rise or when the lights turn on. The first image of this play, that's what you're describing in the at rise. Now we have a little bit of instructions for dialogue. Uh, Gil, how about you read the little bit of instructions for dialogue and then you and I will read through the little bit of dialogue that's on this first page. Sound, sound okay? Yep, yep. All right. All right. Uh, dialogue instruction, center align name of character speaking, and then left align dialogue character under their name. This is, this is the most standard way that plays are laid out on the page. So when you format your script this way and you submit it to your next big playwriting competition, through just how this is formatted on this page, you are telling those people, I know how to format a play. So that's it. And really the biggest reason why it's set up this way is so that the actors that are reading this piece can see your line of dialogue very clearly. A lot of this structure is going into supporting the production as a whole, including the actors that are reading your pieces and how your line of dialogue looks on the page is really, really important to them, that, to those that are reading it out loud. It's, go, it's up to you to show us when we're supposed to speak as actors. I have definitely seen plays where the name of the character is left line and there's a colon with the line of dialogue. That's acceptable too. It's a lot easier to format, especially in Word. However, this structure that we're giving you really is the most standard of playwriting. So Gil, let's you and I read through these characters. I'll be Leslie Jeffrey. All right. I think it's if to say I'm extremely disappointed to be here with you again, Jeffrey. I'm sorry, mom, but it isn't my fault. And then there's this little, that's all his line is, but if you're following along, great. But if you're not, right next to his line of dialogue is a little sentence that is in parentheses. In this parentheses, it says, 
He digs in his pocket to pull out a stick of gum and starts to unwrap it. This is a stage direction and it has that information right next to it on the handout. Stage directions are the actions that characters need to perform on stage. It, it needs to be placed in parentheses uh, wherever you'd like the action to take place. So if you need Jeffrey, for instance, to chew gum right after his line, you will put those parentheses right after his line. If you like him to fumble in his pocket for a piece of gum while he says his line, you'll, you'll put it before the line starts with that information. Whatever you put in those parentheses, you are telling the act what they need to do in this moment when they are not speaking or while they are speaking. The reason why we use parentheses is once again for our actors. Some people prefer italics. There's a whole world of filmmakers that have a completely different structure to the way that they do this. We use parentheses in theater, that's our language. Actors will know on stage if they see some text on the script that's in a parentheses, that they are intended to perform that instead of reading that. So that's all you're doing is you're helping them with that guidance. And certainly we've gotten scripts that don't use parentheses and it usually turns into a very funny reading. If I were to read this line of Jeffries without knowing that there were parentheses there, it would sound like this. I'm sorry, mom, but it isn't my fault. He digs in his pocket to pull out a stick of gum and starts to unwrap it. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> So that's really honestly why we put those parentheses there and, and why I'm guiding you through as well. Now, if you just look to the bottom of this page, there's a little bit more guidance. And these two elements are once again, from the place of trying to make your piece the most accessible to who you're kind of handing it off to, the director, the actors that are involved in presenting your work. So it, I give a little bit of information about font. Please only use clean, concise, non-italic fonts size 11 or 12 and then I give you some suggestions. Keep your comic sans out of your plays friends. I'm not going to read your comic sans plays. I'm just kidding. I'll read whatever font you send me unless it's winky dinks then I don't speak winky dinks and we'll all be out of luck. But I highly suggest that you pick a font that is kind of boring on the dull side but more importantly very easy to read. That's the point. We're giving the actors the gift of clarity here, the actors and the director. And then just some suggestions on spacing, single space with skipped lines between dialogue, once again, to set, up, set it up on the page so that it's the most accessible. Now, I went through all of this very carefully because it's important. <laughs> Starting your, your play with the proper structure will save you a lot of time from going back and reformatting it later. Um, I also wanted to share how hopefully accessible all of these things are right now. At this point, the only thing that folks following along with this workshop haven't done is write a setting and an app rise. And some of you did that too. I read your, your 10 line scenes this week for those that sent them to me. And some of you already dug into that. Great. For those of you that did it, just use this guidance to develop those two elements for yourself. All right. Now I'd like to, I'd like to invite Mickey and Gil who have been a part of this community voices workshop in the past. Uh, they both developed 10 minute plays, which I am constantly using as examples in this workshop because they're so wonderful. And they both started the development of their pieces step by step through this workshop. And they each had these fabulous page ones of a 10 minute script that they both developed. So with their permission, I've asked them if they wouldn't mind sharing with you all the page ones of these scripts that they developed through my workshop. We're going to start with Mickey, who wrote this fabulous script called The X Games through my Advanced Community Voices workshop two years ago. Um, Mickey, why don't you go ahead and read us through your page one of The X Games. Okay. The X Games by Mickey Vale. That's me. Characters, counselor, woman in mid to late 30s, Zuri, outspoken woman in late 20s, very dramatic and animated, uses grand 
grand hand gestures when she speaks. Mossy, an attractive woman in her late 20s, quiet and soft-spoken, she cries a lot. Stevie, attractive woman in her early 30s, delicate and reserved. Scene one, the setting is a sparsely furnished room in a quiet office building. It's 4 p.m. At Rise, four women are seated in folding chairs in the center of the room. They're positioned in a small circle, all facing each other. Spotlight is on Mossy as she dances as if in a dreamlike state. The other three women are in the dark. Back down memory lane by Minnie Ripperton plays. The lyrics are stumbled on this photograph. It kind of made me laugh. It took me way back. Back down memory lane. And then the song slowly progresses. As the song progresses, Mossy sits down and stares sadly at her phone. The music fades out. First line, counselor, Mossy. Lights come on, music, Mossy snaps back to attention and quickly hides her phone. Mossy, oh, yes? Counselor, I asked, what is it that you want to get out of group today? That's it. That's great. <laughs> That's wonderful. A fabulous page one of the script. You can see why I asked her to share it. Her character descriptions are nice and specific, but also not too heavy, you know? The more specific you are with your character descriptions, the potentially more difficult it might be to cast your character. Uh, if you're somebody who really values diversity in your work, try to err on the side of a lighter description with some less specificity or specify that diversity that you want in your script. That's very important to remember. Mickey, I want to ask you a couple questions about this piece in your development so the folks at home can kind of know what this experience was like for you. Mm -hmm. um, when you developed this, this play and I asked you to write your page one, did you feel like you could continue? You could just dive into the rest of it at that point? Yes. As you know, it took me a while to actually start writing the play. But once I did write um, all the elements and the characters and the, the at rise, once I had an idea for where it was starting, then yeah, it was easy for me to write. And it's going to feel like that for a lot of you at home. Some of you might still feel stuck through this process, you might send me a message saying, I don't know if this is any good and we can talk. And some of you might feel like I'm stunting you by asking you to do just one page. And once again, then don't continue writing, continue writing your heart out. Just know that you might go back and change things up and other things might happen in this workshop that may influence you into a different direction in your piece. But that's okay. As long as you know we're still in the experimenting and brainstorming moment of this workshop, it, it's okay to write as much as you want. Um, so my other question for you is, did your page one change a lot throughout our process together? Or was it exactly the same from the beginning to the end? Um, no, it definitely wasn't exactly the same. It changed. It changed a couple of times. Um, I got maybe halfway through and then I went back and changed. I, I, you know, I started writing and then I realized, oh, I wanted to start this way. And yeah, so it definitely changed. And this will absolutely happen to you all at home. Some of you might be the kind of folks that don't want to go back and edit things, but playwriting is a little bit different. You're going to write to a place where you realize you need more, you need another character, you need to change their location and you will go back and change that first page and it's completely okay and this is the workshop that process is going to be supported so don't be afraid to start because you're going to start again and again and again and that's great <laughs> the more you get through this process the more you write the, the, the more accessible it's going to be and the less precious every word is going to be for you and the more willing you'll be to edit and make it better. But let's go to Gil. Gil, why don't you go ahead and share your page one of the fabulous script, Rich People's Problems, which I literally use in every workshop I teach. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so this is Rich People's Problems. Uh, character is Chloe Van Warren, daughter of an investment guru and celebrity Charles Van Warren. It's, she's in her mid-20s. We have Miles Prophet, an ambitious corporate driver in his early 30s, comes from nothing, wants it all. 
The setting is in winter, a back road in Camarillo, California, an affluent suburban community 30 miles, 30 minutes north of LA. Miles is pacing desperately to get cell reception, but keeps getting cut off. Chloe has her head in her hands. They've just gotten into an accident. Miles, yes, yeah, we're on the Pacific Coast Highway near Las Postas Road. No, 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 Pacific Coast Highway, PCH. P-C-H, P as in please tell me you speak English. C as in hello, help. Chloe, reception is terrible here. I I'll tell you what, my car is fine. Let me drive to a better area and I'll, I will call you a tow truck. Miles, can't, this isn't my car. I'm just the driver. I need a police accident report so they don't think I drove into this telephone pole on my own. If I don't get that report, that's my ass. Great. Gil, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Let's chat about that as we did with Mickey's. Sure. Um, so after writing this first page, did you feel ready to dive into your whole play? Yes, definitely. Uh, mainly because uh, I'm more of a conceptual writer than an intuitive one, meaning I, I, uh, anal I think of the whole story, what's going to happen from beginning to end, and then I just dive in and kind of word vomit, not worrying about any editing in the beginning, uh, and then I go back in and really start to uh, edit and fine tune to to where I like it. You know, um, I, I always teach students to write for the trash can, you know, write like no one's going to read it because no one is unless you snitch on yourself and show people before it's ready. So um, you can uh, that's that's basically how my process is. Which I love. And I also, you know, I identify with so much of that. And that's why Gil and I are collaborators and we work together pretty frequently mm -hmm. because we both understand the value of brainstorming, the, I, the value of taking the time to really map out what you want to say in your piece before you actually start writing it. Mm -hmm. And so once you dive in, it's, it's very accessible to you. Um, Gil, did your first page change a lot from the beginning to the end? Yeah, because you discover, not a lot, but you start to discover uh, your character's voice. You start to discover more of their intention, what they really want as you're writing the story. So then when you go back in and edit, then you, you're like, okay, she wouldn't really speak like that or he wouldn't really talk like that. And then you can you can uh, fix your page one or page 20 if you need to. But uh, it's important to just really just once you have the overall, like you know where the story is going, write it out and and then go back in and, and fix anything that you need to. I love your phrase writing for the trash can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it it's it, it's it speaks to the value of doing it yeah. and taking the pressure off of yourself that the second you start writing you have to be perfect. You just don't and you just won't. And I never was. And I know very few people who knock this process out of the park upon fingertips to keyboard. And, this, and, this is a, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, what I was going to say is, and it also gives you a permission to a, like get weird with it, get strange, go in new places that you wouldn't think of. And that could be some of the, the gems of it. Um, you know, the, the biggest accomplished, the biggest thing is, finishing that first draft and feeling accomplished, like, hey, I did it, instead of having like these half written stories like stuck in a, uh, in a file in your computer. I love it. We're all gonna get t-shirts, let's say, right for the trash can on <laughs> that, and we'll wear them whenever we write. <laughs> Thank you both for always being willing to share. I put these two on this spot all the time, but they're so talented and I just love sharing their work and their process has been a very inspiring thing for me to watch uh, as their once educators and, and now just their colleague. <laughs> now we're gonna get to my very favorite part of today's workshop. We're gonna share and discuss some submitted work from online viewers. I got permission to share three different four actually four different 10 line scenes from viewers today i actually don't know if i'm going to have time to get through all of the ones i promised so if you're at home watching and you're really excited for me to us to read your scene we'll we'll tack it to uh next week and we'll open with that reading so if we don't get to it today we'll get to it next week we promise but um we i i got this permission from people who submitted me their work 
Thank you so much. There have been so many of you that have been uh, following along and it's really thrilling for me as an educator to receive so much work from, you, from all of you. So thank you for sharing with me. Please continue to and I will continue to utilize it in my lesson and, and move us right along and help move you forward. Um, I will never ever share your name live because I am protecting you all from the trolls except myself, but I can handle the trolls. Get back, trolls. I'm going to bring back my actors for today, Jake and Laura, who are going to be uh, reading all of these scenes for us. And then Gil and Mickey and I will be discussing the pieces and how we would use this dialogue to fill in the details of our page one. For the script, uh, if this dialogue is within the theme of what as as if this dialogue was in within the theme of what the playwright at home might want to explore and if if you're watching along and you were like i just wrote that for the exercise that's totally okay we're going to show you once again how each of this work can build into the next project however at any moment if you want to develop something brand new if you want to jump into this first page of your play from a brand new perspective that's great you're inspired we want you to be inspired and we're just going to be using today as an example for the purpose of helping you develop your homework so um let's go ahead and read through the first piece i'm going to be playing the roles of the stage directions for today. Jake and Laura, are you ready to read the other script? Ready. Yep. All right. Okay. So the characters in our first 10 line scenes are George. Um, George used to be partners with Hugh in a private investigation firm. He is glib, is a people person, and likes to take credit for anything he can. And then there's Hugh who was the logical one in the previous firm. He's serious. He likes to get deep into investigation, never got any credit for solving the case. And the two had not worked together for three years. And here's the dialogue. Come on, you know it used to work. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. It worked for you. It did not work for me. We're on the same case. There's no point in us chasing the same leads. Let's work together. Why? I've already solved the case. Well, almost. Because I need you. That's why. You never needed me. Well, I do now. What? What did you just say? And that's it. <laughs> that's that is the entire scene for this and it's perfect. It's 10 lines of dialogue. Now I want to start by giving this writer some compliments way to listen to the advice from from our last session. You kept your dialogue light. You didn't reveal anything and you left us really in the palm of your hands. We want to know what is going on with these guys. And I think that uh, this this writer said that they did they didn't know if they liked the last line I, I think it's great i think you left us in a cliffhanger and i think you developed some dialogue that would be fabulously easy to expand on if you wanted to so uh we are not you and we are not in your brain but we did hear this piece out loud so i'm going to invite up uh, mickey and gill and we're gonna you know try to decide how we would fill out your very first page one if this were the start of your whole scene. Now, um, you did a really great job of writing these characters. So success, you already have that very first part of page one. If there's any additional characters that are going to make it into your play, go ahead and add their descriptions to this list. It's okay if they're not in this first scene or they come up later, um, but, Mickey, <laughs> if you were to pick a setting for this location, where would it be? And I want to encourage you all at home to make choices about your setting and at rise that might be able to raise the stakes of your piece if possible. So Mickey, where would you set this piece? Hmm. Um, I think it would be fun. I think it would be fun if they were on a boat, like a party boat. Oh, <laughs> yeah, a small yacht. So what, what time of day is it? 
nighttime. All right. Okay. So just hearing those words that this scene is now set on a boat at night. How does that change what you heard? It changes it quite a bit, right? There, there might have been a moment where you imagined them in an office or on a bench and it's daytime. What could these two businessmen be talking about at on, on a boat in the middle of the night? It really does change the scenario, changes the stakes. And for you that wrote this at home, that might be absolutely the opposite of what you imagined. But we're just experimenting here. We're just brainstorming ideas and just the idea of the scene now on a boat, how does that change the environment for you? How could setting your piece in different locations at different times really change the action of the script? Um, Gil, what would you describe as the, at, what would you think is an at rise for this piece? What's a good at rise? Whatever we see as soon as the play starts. Uh, okay. Uh... As uh, as we hear sounds of a party in the background, um, the two characters are uh, crouched in all black in front of a door, uh, trying to get it open. Like they're sneaking. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so not only are these men creeping on a boat in the middle of the night, uh, they are trying to break into it right. for some reason. <laughs> And all while having this conversation that's very secretive right now. And, you know, once again, that might not have been your intention at home. Maybe you saw them in an office. But once again, what does, how does that at rise, imagining this beginning, really kind of change the whole piece, in, inspire it in a different way, make, makes it a little more exciting. Now, you might all not be able to create really intense stakes in your setting and at rise, and that's okay too. You might have a really clear idea that this is a piece that needs to happen at noon at a grandma's house. And that's really, really important. We're only suggesting if you can, if there's a way that you can utilize the setting and at rise to support your exploration in writing this piece, please do. The world is very different at 1 a.m. than it is at 1 p.m. And people are different at that time too. And these things, should matter to the world of your play. You should make this choice for a specific reason. Um, we have time to share one more reading with everyone. I knew I was gonna run out of time. So uh, please know if I ask you to use your script, we're gonna just kick things off next Tuesday by reading the scripts that we didn't get to today. Um, but I'm going to go through this second script and I'm going to change the name in it because the person who wrote it put their name in the script, but we will change it. Um, and let me go ahead and read their character descriptions. Sarah, female, at the beginning of her 50s, single without children, although she also has children. She works in theater, she can procrastinate better than anyone, but gets lost in her thoughts continuously. And as a result, her personal workspace and apartment are However, when she is taking a shower by herself, she takes a position on the front of the plate of the plate. She makes bold statements, she makes a point of her style, and makes people to stand out. And then we have Lori, another female, who's back in cooperation with her husband's older sister, Sarah. Married without children, although she always wanted them. She's a teacher who keeps her daughter's Katie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think when you when your face is down, it's really hard to hear you. Will you would I think it was hard to catch that last part. Oh, hey, read that again. That's oh, great. Perfect. I'm sorry. That I'm amazing. reading off of my laptop. Thank you. Thank you. Notes at home. I'm just. Uh, did you? Okay. So we. Uh, I'm going to go through these quickly. So mm -hmm. we have Sarah, female at the beginning of her fifties, single without children. Um, I'm just reading through this a little faster. She can procrastinate better than anyone and gets lost in her thoughts continuously. And it results, her personal workspace and apartment are a cluttered mess. However, when she is interested in a topic or task, she can hyper-focus to the point of tunnel vision. She makes bold statements with her personal style in an attempt to stand out. And then we have Lori, a uh, female exactly four years younger than her older sister, Sarah, married without children, although she 
also always wanted them. She's a teacher who teaches other teachers how to teach reading. I love that sentence. She has always colored within the lines and done what people expect of her. She's actually stronger than she thinks and pure of heart, always wanting to help whenever she can. She tries not to stand out. Thank you for your notes at home. Let's hear the dialogue. <laughs> okay, I know it's here. Just give me a minute. Um... I'm sure it is. I've only been here like five minutes and I'm pretty thirsty from the plane. Can I get something to drink? I was just looking at it last night and then I made that cauliflower crust pizza. I had some wine, watched the voice. Water, anything is fine. Just tell me where the glasses are and I'll help myself. And then Rich called me and gave me your flight information. Does your husband not like to talk to me on the phone? Is that why he used our brother in an interstate game of telephone? Should I call Richie and ask him to ask you where you keep your glasses? The cabinet above the sink. Don't be a smart ass, that's my job. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Now what's on the itinerary this afternoon? Uh, well, you have to see this book. As soon as I can remember where I saw it last. Oh my goodness, I didn't come to San Diego to look at a book. I can do that in Chattanooga. Not this book. So not Sarah took one extra line and you know what, not Sarah, we'll forgive you because you did such a great job on the assignment. I really enjoyed that. And I, you really wrote some very fun, a very fun relationship between sisters. You can very much imagine who they are. And even though you might not have known it, you also included a little bit of a setting and an at rise in your character description, which will make this exercise of starting your play very easy for you. So um, Mickey, given what you read, where do you, where do you think they are this time? What's their setting? Um, I think that they are inside, what was her name, Sarah? Yeah, Sarah. Sarah. And Sarah's very, um, I don't wanna say messy, very, very uh, character filled apartment. <laughs> <laughs> what time of day would you want it to be? Lori just got off the plane and so um, maybe she got off a late flight and it's nighttime, maybe around 11 p.m. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I get back from travel and it's very late at night, I am not a nice lady. <laughs> so I think that element of just uh, getting off the plane very late at night might very much be influential of, of, these, of these two women in their lives. Um, Gil, what would you want the at rise of this piece to be? The at rise, let's see, she just got in. Um, let's say she just got in from a flight. So at rise, I'm going to go with sounds again. You hear the sounds of another of a party upstairs. So it's like banging. She just wants to go to uh, get some drink, get something to drink and go to bed. So at rise, you hear the sounds of a, of a party going on upstairs. Um, uh, I forget her name, the one coming in. Lori and Sarah. All right, so Lori is, has her um, carry-on luggage uh, in her hand and uh, Sarah is looking frantically for the book and when she's tossing things up, it's hitting Lori, you know? Like she's looking for things and just, she's tossing things around and it keeps hitting Lori and she just wants to go to bed, so. That's my at right. That's fabulous. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. And these ideas, they're all inspired by you. And for those of you that submitted your work today, and I apologize again for not getting to more. We'll share the other pieces at the beginning of next week's workshop. And I'm just so happy that so many of you are sharing your work with me. I would absolutely love to see all of your page ones whenever they are ready. And you can send them to me directly at kharoff at the old globe dot org. That's my email address. And I will share with you some feedback and quite possibly ask you if I might be able to use your work in a live workshop, time willing. So just to reiterate, this week's homework is to create your own page one of your script, just as the handout details for you. Um, so now I'm just going to take a moment and transition to our Q&A. First, I'd like to see if anyone sent any of their haikus. It looks like we've got a couple of them. We've got at least three, four haikus. Hey, uh, Mickey and Gil, 
Would you like to trade off reading those haikus for us? How about we start with Mickey? Mickey, you read our first one and then Gil, you read the second one. Okay. Rays of hope shine down, breaking through clouds of doubt. And now I can rise. Wandering the globe, set my heart and soul on fire. Journey to my joy. The rescue, lost in cyberspace, photo of a huge sad dog. We saved each other. Aww. Hours of toilsome monotony realized, one blinding second. These are so fabulous. I love when you all share your writing with us. Thank you for those that were inspired enough to share it live today. I hope that everybody's given lots of claps in the audience. If you enjoyed those poems, give them some claps. Let's applaud them. We like to clap using the emoji clap sign. So give all your claps in the, in the comments today for those brave souls that decided to share their haikus with us. And it looks like no one has any questions today, which you know what, that's great. That means that I'm being very clear with all of you. <laughs> However, if you're feeling shy and you have some questions that come up after the fact, in fact, you can always email me at kharoff at the old .org. I would love to hear from you. I'm hearing from a lot of you and it's just absolutely fabulous. And since there aren't any questions, I'm gonna give you all a big thanks for joining me again today. And I'm gonna wish you a really great weekend. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get your creativity on. And this first page is very fun for all of you. And we're gonna see you all again on Tuesday, next Tuesday at three o'clock, right here again. It's going to be our fifth workshop. It's gonna be a very exciting one. And I can't wait to see you all again. Happy writing friends. Thanks for being here.